one of the things that we're trying to accomplish with the drought form is a collection of uh, case studies uh, where there are lessons to be learned and then communicated uh, across the region. And, and uh, we're privileged to have the opportunity to examine one of those now. It's a case study um, regarding a partnership between the Gila River Indian Community and Salt River Project. We've got Krista McJunkin, who's the Senior Water uh, Resource Analyst for SRP, and Jason Howder, representing uh, GRIC, the Gila River Indian Community, and I will let them describe the uh, case study. My name is Jason Howder, I'm an attorney with the um, Aiken Gump, but I'm also a member of the Gila River Indian Community before joining the firm about four years ago. I uh, was in-house counsel for eight years for um, Gila River. I'm gonna provide a little context of um, the community settlement, because this really comes out, this opportunity comes from uh, the tribe settlement, which was approved by Congress in 2004. Get a little bit of background uh, on the Gila River Indian community and um, its goals and why the partnership with SRP made a lot of sense for the community. Now, we, we, it's called the Gila River Indian community because it's comprised of two tribes. For those of you who are not familiar with the Phoenix area, the community is located, it's essentially the southern boundary of the Phoenix metropolitan area. It encompasses approximately 372,000 acres, um, has seven districts, a seven-member council. It's a very, very kind of active tribe in terms of exercising its sovereignty, police force, uh, its own de Department of Environmental Quality. Um, so it's a very, um, in terms of as a, in someone who works in, in my field and representing tribes, it's a very uh, dynamic place and, 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 a, and they have a lot going on. There are two tribes, there's the Pima and, or the Akamal Atam, and Akamal Atam means river people, and the Peeposh, or the Maricopa. The Maricopa, um, which I'm, a, my family is uh, predominantly Maricopa, uh, emigrated up from the, the, the Gila River, uh, Colorado River confluence um, for a number of years, uh, intertribal warfare down there. They, 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 they migrated up the Gila River and then f eventually formed an alliance with the Akamalatham. And so um, um, I kind of joke that we were the kind of the muscle for the Pima. Uh, uh, we tended to be a little taller, a little bigger. Um, and I also joke because most of my cousins are, are that, that are you know, full Maricopa are much bigger than me. I actually have a little um, Hopi blood in me. And so, I don't know if you know, if you remember, or if you're familiar with Pueblo Indians, they tend to be smaller. So, um, you know, had I, had I just been full-blood Maricopa, I'd probably be playing basketball or something like that, but I wasn't fortunate. So I like to show this picture because it, it demonstrates one of the unique things about the Gila River Indian community is that unlike a lot of other Indian tribes in the West, it, it's traditionally an agrarian culture. It's, it is, um, its ties are to farming. And it, they were, uh, the ancestors, the Akamalatham, um, uh, the Hugum were here um, from time immemorial. Our history and our, and our culture is tied to uh, farming and using a lot of water. The history of farming is 2,000 years old, at least. And um, I put this, this last bullet point in 1860, uh, the peak of ag production uh, for the Akamalatham and the Maricopa, about two million pounds of grain annually. What was going on was uh, you had in 1849 the discovery of gold in California, had a lot of settlers coming through, and um, the Akamalatham became the suppliers of those, those people traveling to California. Um, and so they were able to have a very large uh, agricultural uh, economy, really a new economy for them once you had Anglo, United States settlers coming through um, uh, in that period of time. This period of time, kind of the, the, the peak uh, period of time of, of ag production really extended through the Civil War. Um, and then after the Civil War, as settlement, uh, non-Indian settlement started to grow in the Phoenix Valley and, and elsewhere in Arizona, that's where um, water was starting to be diverted from the tribe, upstream diverters, and um, really resulted over a period of time, that coupled with drought and wide, uh, widespread starvation and famine for the tribe. 
given that history, the community um, in, with, in, in relation to the state of Arizona had a very strong claim for water rights in the state. And um, there, was, there was litigation, uh, I won't go through the history of all of that, but um, the community really began to pursue settlement in mid-90s, late 90s, um, and eventually uh, had its settlement approved by Congress in 2004. And um, through that process, this community was able to, um, people who were sitting across the table, the committee was then able to uh, find some common ground in the settlement process. And uh, the, its relationship with SRP in particular turned to one of um, people at odds or entities at odds and, 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 and turned to uh, two entities that are, were in cooperation and really it was in their best interest for the settlement to go forward. The settlement, kind of its, its, its main elements is it provided funding for um, on-reservation infrastructure. One of, the, one of the things the community uh, needed and why it wanted to settle is it wanted not just paper water rights but wet water rights and it needed to rehab or build new um, infrastructure on reservation and near the reservation. So the community settlement has uh, quite a bit of uh, money for the community to, to build that infrastructure. And that, it provides an annual uh, entitlement of uh, 635,000 acre feet. Of that, 311,800 acre feet are is CAP water, Central Arizona Project Water, which makes the community the largest single customer of Central Arizona Project Water. The community is not located on the Colorado River, and uh, its, its claims are really to the Gila River and Salt River, but the political reality is, is that there are other water users uh, using that water, and the settlement really was to provide a way to make the tribe whole, or the community whole, was to use Central Arizona Project Water, Colorado River water, as in lieu water, replacement water. That uh, is, is a big benefit to the community, but it also creates a number of challenges because the community under its settlement is required to pay for the energy charges. So it makes the community also the single largest uh, energy rate payer um, in, in, of CAP water. It's, it's made news in Arizona that the, the Navajo Generating Station uh, EPA rulemaking, uh, which will, is tied to CAP and it provides a lot of the energy to move that water into central Arizona. Um, is creating a number of problems for the community uh, in terms of making that water potentially unaffordable. So um, even though the CAP water is subsidized, it's still um, becoming more and more expensive, which is a, it's a huge challenge for the community, and it needs to look at a number of ways to address that to make sure it can continue to use its water for on-reservation use. So one aspect of the settlement was the the you know, infrastructure for on-reservation use and, and ag development. What the settlement really didn't do was bring back the river. If you talk to an elder, someone who remembers when the river flowed more often or more, more frequently, that was one of the things in their, in their memories that they, that's something they would like to see. So, um, <clears throat> so to, to address that, we wanted to think about you know, water consultants and attorneys look at ways to, um, maybe not to bring back the, the river, but to create projects, riparian projects, uh, on the reservation that would um, kind of have this uh, uh, kind of a cultural importance so community members could come see a riparian area that, that was on the reservation. And not everyone farms in the community, so uh, it was important because having that a river or right, a riparian area on, res, on, the, on the tribe is really the, the, it's evidence that the settlement actually worked and that the tribe actually got a benefit for many, for many community members. So this is a project that we're in the midst of right now. It's, um, it involves, it's a, re, uh, um, a managed aquifer recharge project and that is, uh, the turnout is going straight into the Gila River. And uh, we, we looked at a number of sites uh, in terms of um, whether they'd be suitable for recharge. And this is uh, one site that um, is, was very attractive. Attractive also because um, it puts the water directly into the, 
to the uh, river channel and, um, and there's opportunity to create kind of a park or some kind of recreation area nearby eventually. And working with Arizona Department of Water Resources, this is uh, eventually will be permitted to allow uh, for the creation of long-term storage credits on reservation. So through the settlement, I mentioned before that the community and SRP formed this partnership eventually and um, you know, kind of mutual respect and working on, on um, having common issues and working on, on those issues. And so one of the things that um, both SRP and the community had an interest in was sound water planning. And in, partic in particular, groundwater uh, was an issue for the community. Even though we, we have this water, um, a lot of it's a CAP water, it's very expensive. So having a healthy aquifer um, is in our best interest because a lot of our um, um, ag business on reservation will use pumped water. And so um, you know, finding ways to maybe use CAP water and other, and other ways made a lot of sense. And, uh, and in working with CAP, we came up with this, um, this joint venture. And it's a 20-year agreement because that's roughly when all the on-reservation infrastructure will be done. And um, you know, we can't use all of our CAP water on reservation now, but um, we didn't want to not use it. So that's when we, we started this uh, joint venture uh, with SRP for water storage. And I'm going to turn it over to Krista, who's going to go into the, some more details on that. So um, building off of where Jason left off, I'm going to go over kind of the foundations of the agreement and what it covers. So as he mentioned, it kind of arose out of the opportunities provided by the settlement. So the community has access to the largest subcontract of CAP water, but a delay until it, the water can be put to use. So kind of putting together their assets and their water management uh, goals that they'd like to meet with SRP's uh, need for water resources, put those two things together, and um, it brings these two um, entities that had previously been adversaries to now a cooperative relationship. So um, because of the delay between when the water was awarded to them in the settlement and now um, when it can be fully put to use on the reservation, we're taking an opportunity, uh, advantage of an opportunity to put that water to use in the meantime. And um, in the, um, in the process, hoping to accomplish several water management goals. So the agreement itself created what's called the uh, Gila River Water Storage LLC, which is a, a separate LLC that is it's a 50-50 arrangement managed both by the community, a representative from the community, and a representative from SRP. The agreement for the formation of that LLC um, specified certain water supplies and purposes that those water supplies would be used for. So it begins with a commitment by the community to store up to 2 million acre feet of their CAP water in underground storage facilities in the uh, Phoenix and Pinal active management areas. Uh, and the purpose of that storage is to create long-term storage credits. Um, these are regulated by the Department of Water Resources and they are um, a way to take a, what is what we talked about before, a use it or lose it supply and create a long-term storage credit that can be used in the future. Uh, in addition to the 2 million acre feet that will be stored underground, 30,000 acre feet of CAP water was set aside from the community's um, entitlement um, to be made available under long-term leases, um, long-term meaning 100 years. Uh, in addition, there's also a, a separate option specifically for SRP. Uh, we refer to it as a dry year option, meaning that in years when the water supply available to SRP's shareholders falls below a, a certain threshold, SRP shareholders can choose to purchase um, CAP water um, that's uh, available to the community um, during times of drought, uh, during times of um, kind of acute shortage. Um, that, that availability is 100,000 acre feet um, to, to SRP. There's a limit on how much total under the, during the period of the agreement that would be uh, accessible to us. In all likelihood, it's, a, it's an excellent, um, uh, it's an excellent resource to have in SRP's portfolio. It would be quite expensive water for our shareholders, so the likelihood that all 100,000 would be ordered is pretty low, but it's a great insurance policy for us to have because we know that we would be covered. So the water that's being stored, that 2 million acre feet I referred to, this is a map of the um, uh, storage facilities that has been stored at in the Phoenix Active Management Area. Uh, so the kind of the large areas are, 
are farms. They're uh, irrigation districts where uh, they have a right to pump groundwater and they are permitted as groundwater savings facilities, which means that they take CAP water, surface water, and use it in lieu of pumping groundwater. And the result is water is saved under the ground and it uh, yields long-term storage credits. So much like any other um, water user in the state of Arizona, the community has permits to store water at these facilities and earn long-term storage credits. So this gives you an idea of kind of the locations in the Phoenix area. So the big green area is SRP. We do operate one of these, which is a groundwater savings facility, but there's also Roosevelt Water Conservation District, Maricopa Water District, New Magma. And then this facility out here is um, actually results from a, a joint uh, partnership between um, SRP and CAP. This is a, a different kind of facility. It's direct recharge. So as opposed to being a farm, this is a specially constructed basins that allow for direct recharge to the aquifer. And then in the uh, Pinal County, the Pinal Active Management Area, we have uh, three other facilities that we store uh, water in as well. The locations of storage were, were chosen in part to anticipate where future growth will occur so that the water supplies can be stored in advance to anticipate those locations of growth, but also as kind of a buffer for the community's water supplies. Uh, as Jason mentioned, maintaining groundwater levels is a chief concern. So by storing water in the, in the facilities that kind of ring around the community, um, the, the hope is, is that instead of having um, growth that occurs around the borders of the community be based on groundwater, instead it'll take advantage of these renewable water supplies. To give you an idea of, of who might take advantage of these water supplies, um, certainly municipal water um, deliverers, whether it's cities or private water companies, um, would be interested in these water supplies because they meet the, the state assured water supply requirements. They would be long-term supplies, 100-year um, leases, or the purchase of credits, which, um, uh, which meet the renewable supply requirement. Um, among uh, industrial water users, because of uh, regulations regarding the types of water that can be used for certain industrial purposes and conservation limits, uh, mining companies, manufacturing, data centers, we've talked about any, any facility, any industrial facility that has a large cooling need would certainly um, need to uh, be aware of the regulations on what types of water supplies you can use. And there's a, uh, incentives for using renewable water supplies as opposed to groundwater. Uh, those same types of incentives exist for large turf facilities where there's limitations on how much groundwater they can use but uh, as a way to encourage them to use renewable water supplies. So things like golf courses or homeowners associations that have large open space areas that have um, a large water demand. For those of you that aren't familiar with long-term storage credits, I wanted to go over kind of why they're unique and uh, what they, uh, the opportunities that they offer in terms of water management. So really, uh, what sets them apart from other water supplies, um, I'll go over that in a moment, but they're needed for residential development, as I mentioned, uh, for, to meet municipal demands, but also for industrial water demands, and they have some distinct advantages. So um, for, for brevity of time, since this is more focused on, on industrial, I didn't go into great detail on the uh, residential side, but the, the main issue with residential de water demand is the fact that these water supplies meet the 100-year assured water supply requirements. But for industrial development, um, because industrial water users in certain um, industries are subject to uh, conservation requirements that limit how much groundwater they can use, if, they, if their process or their um, uh, industry requires them to use more than the conservation uh, requirements will allow them to use, their best option is to replace their use of groundwater with the use of renewable water supplies. So this is a, um, uh, a way to as we talked about before, match the type of use with the, the water supply that makes the most sense. So having uh, long-term storage credits available for this purpose allows the industrial water user to find a replacement supply in a market that is otherwise uh, difficult to find new renewable water supplies. Um, so the types of facilities, generally speaking, uh, if an industrial water user, outside of mining and golf courses, really there's, n there's not a, a particular um, industry that we're focused on. It's really just any facility that has a large cooling need. So data centers have been one that have uh, really paid attention to this because uh, we've see noticed that um, there are many more data centers that are choosing to uh, try and locate in Arizona um, because uh, despite <laughs> recent <coughs> flooding, we generally don't have um, much in the way of natural disasters and it's a good way for um, cloud-based businesses to back up their, their data. Um, but what that brings with um, is the need for cooling because uh, not only is it hot here, but certainly the, um, um, the computers themselves get hot. So they have a, a huge cooling demand and that results in a, and sometimes a very large water demand as well. Um, 
But there are also other manufacturing um, processes that require large amounts of water. Um, earlier, um, there's a question or a comment from Doug from the uh, city of Chandler re referring the use of, of effluent for um, industrial water users. Um, Intel, in particular, has made you know quite a science out of reusing water multiple times. Um, and th one of the incentives for doing that is because they're using a renewable resource and they get the benefit of, of um, uh, being able to put that water supply to use as opposed to being reliant on groundwater. So a uh, growth in that area, we would expect to see um, other um, types of industrial processes um, wanting to use that type. Uh, some of the unique advantages of long-term storage credits. So as we talked about uh, earlier, we talked about how underground storage, unlike surface reservoirs, is not subject to, uh, to evaporation. It's stored under the ground. Um, it can be stored until needed. So right now we're storing um, water that, that may not be used for many years, but we're trying to take advantage of this window of time when the community can't put the water to use directly uh, to store it in advance. Um, it's not a use it or lose it supply. So if, if an entity or a water provider were to buy long-term storage credits, those credits can stay in their account until they need them. So how we were uh, talking about the incentives um, that kind of work against that um, in terms of uh, typical surface water use where you're in incentivized to use a water supply um, in advance whether you need to or not in order to secure your right, that doesn't, that incentive, that kind of negative incentive that we're, that we're not fond of doesn't exist with long-term storage credits. You're not penalized to hold them in your account over time. Uh, that they're easily traded as long as you're dealing with inside the same active management area. And um, the recovered uh, water uh, doesn't typically require the same type of treatment if you were using the surface water directly. So when you go to recover it, generally speaking, it has the, the characteristics the, uh, of, of groundwater that you're recovering it from. And, and in particular, what we're concerned with is storing it in areas where growth is anticipated. Um, it's one of our goals is to match up as closely as possible the location where the water is stored with where it will be used. So part of our planning is to have a, as diverse a portfolio as possible of where the water has been stored and to work with um, existing infrastructure and owners of existing infrastructure to see that that water is recovered from the actual area. So just a, a brief example. Um, the the LLC was able to sell long-term storage credits to the city of Maricopa for a, a public park that they needed a water supply for. The water, the credits that they were purchasing were stored at the Maricopa Stanfield Irrigation District. They actually signed a separate contract with the Maricopa um, Stanfield Irrigation District to use their wells to recover the water. So they're taking advantage of existing infrastructure to meet an industrial water demand and um, recovering the water literally from where it was stored. So really to me that's kind of the model that we would like to try and replicate where you're tying the location where the water was stored with where it will be used. And I think that's it. So I'm um, happy to take any questions. From the, from the tribal perspective, the other advantage to this is there's in Arizona, there's two ways to really market. Well, well there's more than that, but there's two major ways to market water. The, the one that mo people are most familiar with is leasing water. And um, those typically require to meet the uh, a municipality's needs a 100-year supply or a 100-year lease. Well, that ties up a tribe's water for a very long time and it really reduces their flexibility for their own water use. And so the, one of the other reasons why the, the credit system made a lot of sense for the community was we had a 20 ware window where we weren't going to be using water but we're going to want to use some of that maybe not all of it but some of it um, eventually and so um, this provides that flexibility and and and, and also to be able to meet uh, our neighbors needs so uh, knowing what you know now uh, what would you have done differently in pursuing this partnership so what what are the major lessons learned what advice would you give to similarly situated uh, entities who are thinking about working together on the same kinds of uh, uh, storage and supply and allocation issues that you all addressed? Economics of the deal, which are private, but those could always be better in, in my client side. That, that's <laughs> nitpicking there, really. Um, I think if, if, if there's one um, area that that we would have, um, or if I could do over a little bit, is some of just the, the federal regulations that um, uh, kind of, because this is water that's part of a, a water settlement that's approved by congressional leg legislation, there was some um, educating with the Bureau of Reclamation to get them on board to some degree, and that held up things a little bit. So the 
in hindsight, we probably could have got them on the same page with us earlier, but that they eventually did. It was just it took a long time to get there, longer than we uh, we would have liked. But that was one area where it involved federal legislation, and 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 often if you don't have that, you're, that's not a concern of yours. But uh, it was here, and and that was a delay in our in our in some of what we wanted to do. I think one thing that surprised me was. Um, I would explain to someone new about what the agreement said and what our plans were. And um, then I'd meet them in another circumstance and they would ask a question and it would occur to me they didn't quite get it. That sometimes they've had to hear it multiple times. And I think that's owed to the fact that um, water in general, but in Arizona in particular, is, is complicated, but we also kind of get set in our ways. We expect water to work a certain way. And when someone tries something new, it takes a little while for it to kind of not just the idea itself, but the implications of the idea. So um, just, a, you know, for example, um, <laughs> um, the, the irrigation district that I re referenced being involved in the, re the recovery of the water, I probably had to explain it to them like five times before they understood that this was an opportunity for them. <laughs> this was a good thing that they actually had infrastructure that they weren't currently fully utilizing and they could utilize it and they could probably utilize it long beyond the the their, their farming operation because, you know, a well in the ground that operates is, is useful, especially if it's in an area that has stored water. Um, so I think I um, probably, if, if we're to do anything differently, it'd be to change our approach to educating people about w where the opportunities lie, that there's um, uh, really some um, benefits to this that you kind of just have to be very specific about. You can't just assume that people will put the pieces together. So um, that's probably what surprised me the most. The agreement that, that the, the community and the SRP struck um, is geared to fix or address a certain area of the state and a certain set of issues. It's not a global fix. It doesn't solve every issue. So I think to that extent, um, when you have kind of a defined goal, uh, it's a lot easier to come up with, you know, kind of meeting those deal points as opposed to some of our larger stakeholder processes that by just everybody's participation requires everybody has an issue that they'd like to see fixed. We really just had two parties that um, had some goals and, and found a way to, to make them coalesce. You know, it's, it's interesting that um, uh, kind of the, how the timing worked out. So probably the first, um, once um, the Bureau kind of gave the thumbs up is really what prompted us to announce the agreement. And that happened at about the same time that the excess CAP pool um, was declared to no longer be available beyond the water bank and the GRD. And um, so just for out-of-staters, the um, any uh, CAP water that doesn't get ordered is goes into an excess pool and there's a list of defined um, entities that have a kind of a claim on that water on an annual basis and the the first big group are farmers and then there's a couple other regulatory agencies and then if there was any left over anybody could m sign a one-year contract to get some CAP water um, as more people were that had contracts were ordering their water there was less and less water available in the excess pool um, so that kind of coincided so we had a lot of attention early Early on and it became um, abundantly clear that one of the challenges we would face is when someone's used to getting water from a canal and we're trying to sell them credits you had to get them to think about well okay I'm used to just having I just have a turnout and water comes out and we want to sell them a credit to something that they have to either get access to somebody else's infrastructure or they have to put their own in to pull that credit out of the ground so that presented some challenges for us where we had to you know we tried to get creative, we tried to come up with some solutions, and we were able to, f to, to meet some needs where, um, you know, there, there was one case where it was actually a, a small golf course located on SRP land that we, w SRP uses our facilities to, to um, recover the credit for them and put it in our canal and deliver it to them. So physically they were still getting the same water, but those, that infrastructure doesn't exist everywhere. So um, it did, that, that definitely presented some challenges to us. Um, but in general, uh, you know, I think once people get more comfortable with the idea of buying a long-term storage credit as being the, the, you know, it is a water right. And once they kind of grasp that, then it's more just about working out every, every deal has, you know, they're all little unicorns. They all have their special little, you know, issues to deal with. And um, whether it's an infrastructure issue or regulatory issue, um, that water it's, uh, yeah, sometimes water quality. Um, so um, it's, it's kind of just problem solving. Uh, I want to thank uh, Jason and Kristen.